Hello, and welcome to the DIY Investing Podcast. My name is Trey Henniger, and I'm your host. Today, we are discussing an issue that I believe every investor goes through at one point in their investing career or another, or if you're like me, quite often, and that is the dead money problem. Today, I'm going to answer the question of how to solve the dead money problem. We're going to begin to defining what dead money is. We're going to discuss the importance of really understanding that time is money. And I'm going to provide you a formula and principle for how to analyze potential opportunity cost losses in your portfolio. At the end, we're going to go over my solution for the dead money problem and provide you with valuable actionable ways to think about the stocks in your portfolio with your new perspective. Stay tuned for all that and more. If you're listening to this, don't forget, I could really use a like if you're listening on YouTube. Hit that subscribe button, whether you're listening on YouTube or any of your podcast platforms, and a five-star rating review are a great way to support the show. So let's dive right on in. Today, if you can only remember one thing I want you to remember that time is money. Now you've heard this before. You've heard time is money before and often people are thinking about it, about being able to earn money with wages, um, going to work, producing stuff along those lines. But today we're thinking in terms of portfolio management and you need to remember that time is money. And that is why dead money is a problem. And so, Again, time is money. Keep that in the back of your head as we go through this podcast. So let's begin with what is dead money? I'm going to define dead money as any asset that you own in your portfolio that is not growing intrinsic value over a period of time. And that's a really important definition that that we're going to break apart here. So it's an asset. So it's not something um, that's talking anywhere outside our portfolio. We're talking in context of our portfolio. So assets in our portfolio, and they're growing, not growing intrinsic value over time. That also means we are focusing on the fundamentals of the business. We're not focusing on the stock price. And and that's really key because we can't predict stock prices. And so we're not going to even try. We're going to limit ourselves and limit our thinking to business fundamentals. If we're talking about a business, um, you know, fundamentals of, of real estate, if we're talking about real estate, fundamentals along those lines. What are the drivers of intrinsic value and are those drivers growing over time? If not, then that asset is dead money. Now, obviously, in a lot of circumstances, you're trying to own assets that are growing intrinsic value over time. And so if you are buying assets that aren't growing intrinsic value over time, usually there's a good reason for that. We'll we'll touch on a few of those in in the show, but... What I want to differentiate here is we're not talking about the long term. We can, you know, if you if you own assets that aren't growing intrinsic value over the long term, 10, 20, 30 years, I I have major concerns for for how you're managing your portfolio because I don't think that's a winning method. Um, but what I'm focusing on in this show is the short and medium term. 3 months, 6 months, 12 months, 2 years, 3 years, 5 years, okay? So let's call it five years or less. We're thinking about assets that over the next, you know, one to five years are not growing their intrinsic value. It's not to say that they won't grow their intrinsic value in the future. It's that during a short period of time, short to medium term, there's going to be a period where the intrinsic value is not growing and you believe you can predict that. So that's really important. Now, why does this come up? Well, I think there's always cases where you've bought a stock, you like the company, but you can pretty clearly anticipate a period of dead money where the company is just not getting better right now. Their earnings aren't growing. Maybe, you know, you look forward three, four, five, six, seven, eight quarters you know, one to two years, one and a half years, and you say, I don't think the earnings are going to grow. 
maybe the earnings are going to go down over the next year. You look forward and there's hard comps and you can see clearly that earnings are decreasing and they're going to decrease maybe for a predictable amount of time, you know, one year, two years, whether that's due to a recession, whether that's due to short-term business problems like what Facebook's going through um, with Apple's privacy changes so they can see short-term losses in their um, bottom line. It's going down more than you'd expect. Um, any number of things where you look out and you say, over the next year, two, three years, things aren't going to get better. It might be, you know, let's say you're earning a dollar per share today and three years from now, you still think you're going to be earning a dollar per share. Now, maybe in the long-term future, you think this company is going to compound, but, you know, for the next two or three years, you don't see any progress being made. So what do you do? That's what we're here for. That's the dead money problem. You own an asset that's not growing its earnings. So what are a few examples of this? And let's dig on into a couple. Well, the first most obvious example is cash. If you have cash, not only are you not earning, you're growing your intrinsic value over the long term, you're absolutely not growing your intrinsic value over the short or medium term. So when you hold cash, all of that cash counts as dead money because it's not increasing its intrinsic value. Now, you might earn a little bit of interest from that, and you can calculate that when we get down to our formula as you know maybe an offset on the expected alternative gain, but 90% of the time, cash is not earning as much in intrinsic value over time as something like a stock or a business. So cash is one example. Another example are asset plays. And asset plays are companies that aren't even really companies. You're really buying an asset. You're buying something that doesn't have growing intrinsic value, but you have something that has fixed intrinsic value. These are very popular among deep value investors or just value investors in general, where you maybe have some sort of external validation of what the company's worth, but there's no earnings to back it up. An example might be um, an set of oil assets that have not yet been monetized or, or um, gold mines, silver mines, copper mines um, that are during the exploration phase. And so they've not been validated yet because there's no cash flows coming off. And so what you'll have usually is some sort of report that determines what that's worth. And maybe they'll say the comp you know, the mine is worth $200 million dollars. Um, based upon the net present value of future earnings, but that's you know using some sort of discount rate they came up with. And so you're trying to buy at a discount to whatever that valuation is, but that valuation isn't changing. That valuation's static. And so the way you make your money is that you buy at a discount and hopefully people get excited about gold or copper and they bid it up or people get excited about oil. And so even though you're not producing money from your oil wells, you're able to resell them to someone else and then you capture that difference from the catalyst. To me, that's dead money because the fundamentals aren't improving. And that's going to be dead money over a relatively longer period of time. It's not just one year. It might be three, five, ten years where it's a static value. Um, another, a good example of this is Keweenaw Land Association, KEWL. Um, they were a bunch of timber assets. And so they were producing some earnings. But on a PE basis, it might have been valued at you know 30 plus times earnings, 40 times earnings, and those those earnings weren't growing. And so to me, I'd say it's overvalued on an earnings basis, but on an asset basis, maybe a third party strategic buyer might be willing to buy that for that price because they're going to be using it for other reasons. They're able to get some additional value out of it. So you might have had it valued by a third party at a certain rate and even though that rate doesn't reflect the underlying cash flows, it has some sort of static value. And so that static value is what I'm talking about here, and it's relatively dead money. And so the longer you hold it, again, time is money, the longer you hold dead money assets like that, the bigger the problem is for your portfolio. Because 
you become worse and worse off the longer you hold something without any sort of monetization. Now, if you get a relatively fast monetization of an asset like that, then it's okay. Then you're able to monetize, you're able to get out. But it's kind of like, you know, cigar butt investing, but the last puff never comes. Well, the cigar butt investing is dependent upon that last puff. If there's no last puff, then at the end of the day, you just have a used cigar butt and that's relatively worthless. And so you really have to be careful with dead money. Um, Those are examples I don't spend a lot of time on in terms of my portfolio because what what I worry about is I want to buy companies that are growing their intrinsic value. They're compounders over time. They're trying to become those 10-baggers that I look for all the time. Well, the thing about a 10-bagger, the thing about a compounder is that they don't compound in a straight line. Often there's a lot of periods of flat business performance. And so perhaps they're going about, you know, they they spent a year or two after you bought the company and they've been improving and growing earnings, but now they're forecasting declining demand or they're forecasting um, the need to reinvest in the business and maybe buy a new facility and it's going to take a year or two to get that facility up and running. And so maybe two years from now, you can see, okay, maybe they'll be able to start growing again, but maybe they're maxed out on capacity today. Well, over that next year or two, you might look at it and their earnings aren't going to grow. Maybe they're going to have static earnings. Maybe they're going to have declining earnings. And so you say two years of, of earnings not changing. Again, you have dollar per share today. Next year, you're going to have a dollar per share. The year after, you're going to have a dollar per share. And so when you look at that, anytime you put like a PE multiple on that, you're going to say, okay, well, if the, if the value is 20 times earnings, then it's worth $20 today, $20 a year from now, $20 two years from now. How much do I really want to hold it for that whole two-year period? Because if you compare that to a company that's, say, growing their earnings, you know, 10, 12, 15%, let's say it's 15%, and so, or let's say it's 10% for simplicity. And so one company you have an option of is going to have flat earnings for two years. The other is going to grow at 10%. So it has a dollar per share of earnings. And then next year, it's going to have a dollar and 10 cents per earnings. And the next year after that, it's going to have a dollar and 21 cents per earnings. And so you look two years out and one company's at a dollar 21 and the other one's at a dollar. They're both available at the same price today. Which one do you want? Well, you're going to want the company that's compounding its value over time. Now, where this becomes difficult is that even if you can forecast earnings, and I think that's hard, it's really hard. So that's always something you have to remember. It's really hard. Um, But there are times I've found myself able to forecast earnings going out six, eight, nine months, 12 months, at least directionally, flat, down, up. And so I say, okay, let's say I'm right about that. What is the cost of staying in the company that isn't growing earnings versus buying in the company that is growing earnings? And so the principle for you today is this formula. And the formula is time times position sizing times your expected return of your alternatives is equal to your lost value. So by using this formula, you can anticipate how much exposure you have to dead money losses. Basically, the more time you spend holding a dead money asset, the bigger your losses. The larger your position sizing, in a dead money asset, the bigger your losses. And the larger your opportunity cost, basically what is the alternative use of your money, that what, how, if that's better, then it means you have bigger opportunity cost losses. So not only do each of these items matter individually, but they compound on each other. If, you have a, if you're gonna have two years of dead money in a stock, And it's a 20% position size. So again, I run a five stock portfolio, 20% in each position is my target. And it's a 20% position size. Well, now I have two times 20% of my portfolio, which is functionally 40% of my portfolio for that two year, you know, it's like 40% of today's portfolio is being invested in this dead money idea. 
And then we have to multiply it by an expected rate of return of the alternatives. Well, I never consider a company less than 10% potential returns, but I'd like to target something like 15 or 20%. So let, let's do the math here. So we take two years is your time. Your position sizing is 20%. So two times 20 is 40%. And then you multiply it by your expected return alternatives. So it's either, let's say, let's call it 10%. So we take 40% times 10%, and then you get a 4% of lost value. Basically, by holding this company over the next two years, you're anticipating losing about 4% of your current portfolio by that decision. Well, that gives you some framing. That's a helpful thing of working. Now, Let's say it's an even better idea that your alternatives, it's not just that you have a 10% potential return in your alternative idea, but you think it's a 15% potential return, or you think if it's a 15% potential return in terms of those earnings that are going to be compounding in your other company, well, that means that you have to do that two years times 20% takes you to 40% times 15% takes you down to 6%. So instead of 4% of your portfolio as a potential loss, now you're at 6% of your portfolio as a potential loss. Now, again, we're not talking about like actual losses in your portfolio from what it currently value is. We're talking about lost money that you won't have two years from now because you invested in something that wasn't growing. So what is 4% of your portfolio worth? What is 6% of your portfolio worth? Likewise, if you think a company is compounding at 20% that you could buy today instead, then that takes it up to an 8% lost value compared to your current portfolio. Those are big numbers. You know, if you have a $100,000 portfolio, 4% is $4,000, 6%, $6,000, 8%, $8,000. Well, that becomes a huge deal too if you have something like a million dollar portfolio. A million dollar portfolio, a 4% loss is 40 grand. A 6% loss is 60 grand. An 8% loss is $80,000. That's a lot of money. And so using this formula can put in perspective what your potential losses are in terms of your opportunity cost. So for me, 4%, 6%, 8% returns are quite high. This dead money problem, essentially, based upon my formula, is a very big deal for concentrated portfolios. Now, let's take the same numbers, but instead of having a five stock portfolio, we're gonna take it to a 20 stock portfolio. So we're going from concentrated to diversified. Most people would consider a 20 stock portfolio relatively well diversified. So if we take a 20 stock portfolio and we take the same two year period where we think one of our stocks is dead money, and the position sizing is 5% instead of 20%. And the expected rate of return of our alternative is 10%. We're going to start there. So we take two years times 5%, gets you up to a 10% exposure, times your 10% potential return, and that takes it down to 1% of your current portfolio. So in our diversified portfolio, all of a sudden you can instantly see that the dead money problem is less of a big deal. Because instead of risking 4% of your portfolio by not taking action, by not modifying it in the face of a dead money issue, you now only have 1% of your portfolio exposed. That's not as big of a deal. That's a lot more palatable. Likewise, if you had a 15% potential rate of return, it would only be 1.5% of your portfolio. Or a 20% rate of return would only be 2% of your portfolio. Relatively small numbers in comparison. Now, you can play with these numbers and use this formula. Time times position sizing times expected rate of return of alternatives to put into context your exposure from this dead money issue. Anytime you come across it, look at the company. What do you anticipate? How many years do you think that's going to be a problem? And then look at how that is influenced by your position sizing. Very quickly, you can tell 
This is a much bigger problem for concentrated investors. It's why I'm talking about it. For me, the dead money problem is something I'm going through today in one of my stocks in my portfolio. There's a company I own where I just don't think earnings are going to compound over the next year or two. There's a period of time where I anticipate dead money by holding this company. Now, it might continue to compound at a good rate in the long term. It might have adequate returns across the long term. But like anything, when you have relatively good visibility into the short term, always exceptions, always uncertainty, but that visibility can give you an idea of what you're risking. And what I've discovered is that as a concentrated portfolio, I face a lot of problems with the dead money issue. But if you're listening to this and you're a diversified investor, the more you work through this formula, the more you're going to see that dead money problem isn't much of a big deal for you. And so what's the solution? Let's talk about solutions now. I've set up the problem. I've talked through the framing and how to say how to calculate your potential exposure. But we need to talk solutions. We like to take action on this podcast. We like to provide you with value that you can take back to your portfolio. So My solution is relatively straightforward. Only make changes under two conditions. And those two conditions are, number one, the impact is large. Basically, there needs to be a big lost value bucket. When you calculate that lost value percentage, it needs to be relatively large in terms of your portfolio in order to justify making any decision at all. Second, only make that change if the likelihood of success is also high. You see, there needs to be a big difference in expected return between the two opportunities. Now, at first you might think this is, this could be double counting because I'm using that expected return of alternatives twice. I'm using it to determine the impact and I'm using it to determine the likelihood of success. But that's important because those opportunity costs are the driver of everything you do as an investor. There's a reason it's showing up in both sides of my solution, of both sides of my two conditions. You need to understand what the impact is. You shouldn't fret over potential losses of 1% or less of your portfolio. If you're diversified, this formula is going to almost always tell you it's not a big deal, unless it happens to be you know, the largest per- you know, position in your portfolio and you're anticipating long periods of time and you have good alternatives, then diversified investors aren't going to have a huge deal with this. But concentrated investors, concentrated investors are going to see this problem because they're going to hit high impacts all the time. But they shouldn't make changes just because the impact is large. They also need to consider what's their likelihood of success with the alternatives. And by success, I'm talking about accurately assessing the difference in the potential returns. Again, we're talking about intrinsic value, not stock price. But as you know, just because you can't predict stock price doesn't mean the stock price is going to stay the same. The stock prices can go all over the place. You can get, you can make a good process decision and still be punished on the stock price because maybe you know you anticipate it being dead money, but other people don't. So even if you reduce your position size or sell, others might still bid up the stock leading to a a condition where you won't be able to buy back in later or you're not going to be able to make the profits you anticipate because others saw it too. So in order to justify that decision, your expected return differential needs to be high. And so for simplicity of my calculations, I was comparing you know, a 10% return to a 0% return. But often that's not always the case. It can be a little more complicated than that. So with cash, it's it's typically that easy. If you have a, you know 20% of your portfolio is in cash, you can use this formula to anticipate what your potential losses are in purchasing power over time and by not investing that cash. And it's one of the reasons I have used this formula to decide that I almost always want to be 100% invested because cash is not compounding. I want to own stocks that are compounding over time. And when I hold cash, I'm not holding a compounding asset. Likewise, it can be a little more complicated because you maybe you have a stock that you think is going to all you know compound at only four percent for the next three years. 
but you have an alternative that you think is going to be compounding at 14% over the next three years. Well, now there's still a 10% differential. It's not always dividing by zero for the other one. You need to use that differential between the two ideas. And really, you want a large differential. You know, 5% isn't large. So I'm really thinking double digits. I want there to be a 10% plus differential between those two opportunities. And so my use of 10%, 15%, 20% are clear examples of how I would do this in my portfolio. I'm not going to make changes over small possibilities because I recognize there's uncertainty in the future and I don't want to make decisions under uncertainty that could lead to a worse outcome because they were relatively close. Not only that is usually for many investors, especially those who have you know taxable portfolios, transaction costs, whether it be taxes or just transaction costs can be high. And so you don't want to have action when passivity would be better. So you want to bias towards passive, not bias towards action, bias towards passive. Your goal is that passivity is better than action. Anytime you take an action, it leads to errors. Always remember that you had good reasons for your original buy decisions. There was a reason you bought that company initially. So even though it's coming through some short-term issues, doesn't mean you should just sell it just because there is potential dead money issues. You need to put it in context of your overall opportunities and in terms of what your alternatives are for that specific set of money. Also, this is not an all or nothing game. You know, in my context, you know, let's say I have a 20% position size on something. And so I look and I say, okay, well, there's dead money for a couple of years. Well, the solution isn't sell at all. The solution might just be to reduce the position size until it comes into a sizing, you know, more aligned with its potential alternatives or potential problems. So I don't want a position that's 50% of my portfolio if it's going to be dead money for three years. But maybe that could be a 20% position or a 10% position. I guess if it's a 20% per fo- position, maybe I reduce it to 15, 10, or 5. I can still stay invested at relatively good sizes, but I want to align my money with where I think the most potential opportunities are because time is money. Again, you have to remember that time is money. In terms of portfolio management, your overall performance for your portfolio is going to be driven by this formula, time times position sizing times your actual return for that position, which means when you're making decisions, it should be based upon that same adjusted formula of time times position sizing times your expected return of the positions. So this is why People like to be long-term investors, though, of good businesses because when you multiply a high rate of return over a long period of time, you get very satisfactory results across a portfolio. And so, structure your portfolio at all times to take into account the potential opportunity costs. I'm not an advocate of buying once and never selling not an advocate of buying once and forgetting about stuff. I think if you have the time to evaluate your positions, if you have the time to understand the probabilities and the relative expected rates of returns of alternatives, then it can be valuable to look at this. If you don't have the time, if you can't assess it, then don't. And then a more, much more passive process preferred. Coffee can portfolios can be very successful. And so if you're going to make changes, you need to align everything to make sure that your changes are likely to help you and not hurt you. But at a minimum, you need to make changes and you need to make decisions in the context of your potential lost value. And again, that formula is time times position sizing times expected return of your alternatives. Your solution is to only make changes under two conditions. Number one, the impact is large. That's a big lost value bucket from the formula. And number two, the likelihood of success is high. You want a big difference in the expected return of the stock you own with the stock that you plan to buy.
And I think that should be a double digit difference, at least a 10% difference in the relative compounding rate for the dead money period. Thank you for listening to this episode. If you haven't already, please hit the like on this video if you're listening on YouTube. If you're listening on another platform, please give me a five-star rating review. And don't forget to subscribe so that you can receive notifications when I upload new videos and podcasts for you. Thank you for listening. And until next time, stop paying fees, start building wealth. One last thing, you should start to find a link in the show notes for this podcast to my newsletter. I am launching a newsletter. And so for those that are interested in some written content, you can click over to that newsletter, type in your email, and then you will get access to my thoughts in your inbox. Thank you for listening. Goodbye. The DIY Investing Podcast is presented for general informational and entertainment purposes only. I have not considered your specific situation or risk profile, and I have not provided investment advice. The information presented on the DIY Investing Podcast should not be construed as investment advice. The views and opinions expressed on the DIY Investing Podcast are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's host or sponsors. DIY Investing, its producers, sponsors, and host, Trey Henniger, shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based upon information or viewpoints presented on the DIY Investing Podcast.